Welcome back to the leading edge of integrative mental health. I'm your host, Lisa Dale Miller. Please review and subscribe to the Groundless Ground podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Radio.com, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and of course, find out more at GroundlessGround.com. I'm ready to go. How about you? One year ago, Santa Clara County was the first California locale to go into lockdown. As weird as that was then, little did I know how much more weirdness would ensue in the last year professionally. In a flash, psychotherapists were forced to work remotely with everyone, and somatic psychotherapists had to adapt and figure out new ways to notice and work with nervous system responses session after session on Zoom. Yes, many of us had been using telehealth for some years when necessary, but not every session for every patient. Fortunately, Kathy Kane offered consultation groups throughout 2020 to guide many of us in adopting targeted somatic interventions for effective teletherapy. And in this episode, Kathy returns to share her unparalleled expertise on effective use of somatic interventions in both physical space as well as in cyberspace. She gets very specific about what interventions work and don't work, and the kind of patients that may benefit or be underserved when the medium of contact is screen only. And Kathy gives an in-depth analysis of the interplay of awareness and points of contact in somatic interventions regardless of whether the clinician has physical contact with the patient or not. We also take a deep dive into the role of intersubjectivity in somatic work, the importance of viewing the patient as the expert, and how to skillfully navigate somatic countertransference while keeping in mind the patient's benefit and maintenance of the therapeutic and relational connection. This episode is appropriate for both somatic practitioners as well as novices who may be interested in the mechanics of this work, particularly when applied in the psychotherapeutic process. Kathy Kane, I'm so excited to have you back. (laughs) I know we always have fun in our conversations. We're going to do something very useful today for everybody who's been a practitioner of somatic psychotherapy or body work over the last year of COVID when this has been trying for most of us. What we're going to do today is two things. Describe again for people the basics of somatic psychotherapy, including touch into your work. Also, even the basics for people who are body practitioners and are used to doing this and how this actually works methodologically. And then we're gonna talk about in a year where you can't get near anybody and you have to do this remotely, how has this actually been working? I'm assuming those will both be pretty interesting bits of conversation to have. I hope it will, but I know we'll have fun. We'll see if the listeners do too. (laughs) Oh, I think they're going to have fun and learn a lot. And you're the perfect person to do this because really there's nobody, I feel, out there who has created a methodology for actually training people in how to do and incorporate touch into psychotherapeutic work or any other kind of work that might not be body-based in its essence. Honestly, that came from a version of the conversation that we're starting with for me because I was originally trained as a body worker um, the, the first introduction I had to teaching people how to incorporate touch into a non-body work context was being invited in the somatic psychotherapy program in Australia where I was teaching body work. I was invited by the person who ran the college to come in to start teaching the budding psychotherapists how to incorporate first a kind of a focus on the body, but then also actually using touch. And that really helped me get clear about the why and why would it be important? What's the difference of the purpose of touch in that context compared to what I was trained in, which is what I call repair work, meaning that people have an issue, they have an injury, some kind of stress injury, so to speak, where they've got a tight back or what have you. And really the focus is to get them back to physical health 
So you're repairing that version of damage that's been done. That's a really different focus than when you're working in either a psychotherapeutic context, trauma recovery, anything where the focus is more along the lines of embodiment, presence, addressing what I might call wounds of presence. So people have not felt safe to be themselves and be here and take up space. Uh, that's a really different focus. It needs a different set of skills. And at that time, and even now, what was happening in somatic psychotherapy programs is people were being told to go and take a massage class. And I was just outraged because <laughs> it's a completely different job. It's like saying, well, because you drive a car, you should know how to fly a plane. You know, some of the skills are the same, but really the focus is totally different and the skill set is really quite different. And I just was really upset by this sort of lazy way of <laughs> saying, we're going to give you some pretend skills and then unleash you on your clients. And it just felt really unethical to me to do that that way. So I proposed to the director of the college that we actually create a more integrated program where the skills that were being taught to people were the touch skills and the embodiment, body-oriented skills of noticing what was happening in someone's body and directing them and guiding them in these changes. It was really specific to the non-body work repair side of the picture it's a critical side of the picture, but it does require different skills. So that was 35 years ago now. And it really wasn't being done much at that time. There's more programs now that uh, teach in this context. They, they bring in skills specific to working in the psychotherapeutic context. But at that time, it just wasn't integrated. It was these two totally separate tracks. So I've got a lot of experience in that. That was my original area of expertise. I later developed an additional expertise in doing this in relation to trauma and working specifically with the issues that arise somatically with trauma. That first place it happened was how do you appropriately, ethically integrate body awareness, but also specifically touch into working in a non-repair focus, whatever that might be. Even for some medical practitioners where the way that they're taught to do touch is often so clinical that it causes more harm than it helps. It leaves the person out in the touch that's happening. So there's a lot of practitioners that can benefit from that. Instead of looking at things as I was taught to do, like range of motion, pain level, are muscles constricted? Is there limitation here on what someone can do and feel like they've, they can support it physically? That's a repair kind of focus. When we're using touch or body awareness in an embodiment context, in a psychotherapy context, we're looking at things more that we would name as this sort of amorphous term of presence. Mm -hmm. And how do we define that? And for me, it's a quality of the person having access to their somatic self, not that it's separate from their other versions of self, but at a majority cultural norm, we value cognition, we value thinking, we value social skills, uh, particular categories of social skills. We almost value in no way at all the ability to be present somatically. We like it in children. You know, we find that sort of joyful, gleeful presence satisfying. And this is one of the things Porges has talked about in terms of interoception. We don't teach children how to do it. We actively teach children social skills, communication skills. We don't teach children how to notice themselves, how to be aware of themselves at the interoceptive and somatic level. What does liking something feel like? What does not liking something feel like? What does a boundary, an appropriate boundary, feel like somatically? How do I know that? What is safety like? How do I know when I'm safe? One of the, one of the questions I ask my clients is, how do you know when someone wishes you well? And very often with people, especially with trauma in their history, they haven't a clue. That's like the ABCs. You know, we, we don't expect kids to be proficient in these skills without giving them some support of the building blocks. But we then sort of assume that people are going to get proficient in inhabiting themselves and developing a somatic vocabulary for what they're noticing, how they're noticing it. What does this mean? So to me, using touch and using a somatic approach fills that in if it wasn't there for the person. How are you present to yourself? How do you feel yourself? 
How do you notice other people somatically? How do you notice your effect on other people? And how do you feel their effect on you? How do you read the environment? Do you have a trustworthy assessment? Is your somatic vocabulary, your interoceptive vocabulary accurate? So people with trauma histories will interpret things as unsafe that might actually be neutral. So then they're having conversations with themselves about danger that doesn't exist. And then that becomes unreliable and it's easy to lose trust in yourself. So by default, everything will be unsafe because I can't quite tell what's safe and what isn't. That's the somatic conversation and the, the somatic skillfulness that someone working with trauma, someone working in the psychotherapeutic side of things needs. That's a different skill set. That's a different way to pay attention. Um, and that's what I wanted to do in teaching in that side of things is how do you support your clients in gaining these skills that they maybe don't have, or they had the skills and they've been wounded by what's happened in their life, or they've been rejected and told that that's not true. So that's a very different skill set. You don't need to know the anatomy. You don't need to necessarily even know what a muscle does. You need to have good observational skills. If you're touching, you need to have the ability to feel things like presence and lack of presence. What does a fear state feel like in someone that's not only about muscles being tight, but when someone is feeling fearful, how might you notice that as the practitioner? So that seems like there's some discrete sets of skills that you will impart. So there's a set of skills that has to do with the eyes, learning how to see rather than focus so much on hearing. People in psychotherapy are very trained to hear. It's all supposed to be about words. Seeing the condition of embodiment or presence that I don't think is ever taught other than in somatic psychotherapy contexts. I would say there's also all of the senses would be important. It's the difference between listening to the words and listening to how the words are said. So we're and, taught that you can see when a person is lost in their thoughts. Right. You can see when they're not in the world. It seems like there's a way to see whether the mind is telling the body it's not safe or the body is locked in a habit of unsafety, even though there's no information from the environment for unsafety. I agree. And I think there's another layer in there, which is that some things you can't fake with your voice. Your voice tone will change when you're stressed. It does take a practiced clinician to hear the nuances of that with someone who's very used to pretending that they're okay vocally. Same is true facially. People can arrange their face in a relatively convincing version of social connection. They can force themselves to make eye contact. They can do a pretty good imitation of a person who's present and engaged. But if you include all of the sense information of what you can gather and that quality of presence and breath and all of the things that we know to notice at a somatic level, it gets very hard to fake it when you have an experienced practitioner sitting opposite you, that feeling state in the field, yes. your little hairs stand up on the back of your neck as the, the <laughs> practitioner is like, I feel relatively convinced that you are as relaxed as you're saying. That you you're getting a more genuine indicator if you know how to pay attention to the things that you're talking about. Uh, posture, uh, what, what I call the, the um, anti-gravity effort. So if someone is braced and sort of ready to react and they're in that anti-gravity, getting ready for fight or flight, for example, that's visible if you know what you're looking for. And they yes. might be telling you they're relaxed and they might be taking deep breaths and sort of forcing their breath, but the lie will be put to that by what the rest of their somatic system is doing. And so that's visible to a certain degree. It's feelable. I had to get over my bias that a lot of body workers have, which is that you can feel everything. And then I took the somatic experiencing training and we were forced to sit across from people and look at them. And it was like, wait a minute. For me, this is like working blind because I have my eyes open and my hands not on somebody. And lots of body workers have the habit of closing their eyes to make their hands as big as possible in their brain 
and then you can feel all these tiny nuances. And it was a struggle to see some of what I had been feeling. And of course, what I learned, there's some things that are visible that I can't feel. So then I try to encourage people, the, even if they're touching, to work with their eyes open. I still have the default, if I really need to get attentive physically, I close my eyes. And part of that is the dissonance between what you're seeing and what your hands are feeling. Things feel bigger than they look, for example. And it can be very disconcerting that your hands are telling you there's this very detailed something, you know, you're touching their shirt or something like that. And it doesn't feel the same as it looks. So many of us have a way to kind of get that dissonance out of the channel by closing our eyes or maybe taking our hands off and looking, that kind of thing. Uh, but it turns out there are some things that are more visible than they are feelable. So the more senses we use, that's what I was referring to about hearing. Some things are better that you hear than you feel. So if you've learned to have all of your senses, even that sort of resonant sense of an echo in your own body, you've got lots of different channels to take in the information about what's happening with the person. Then there's sensate touch. It's good for us, I think, to first talk about when you're free to use it. So let's do that first before we go to, oh, wow, COVID's here and now I can't use it. So when you can use it, touch for me, you could definitely correct me. It seems to be a two-way relationship between awareness, the capacity to know what information is arising in the connection you're having with whatever body part and the touch itself. For instance, your hand is having experience and then there's a the mind which is processing and having all of that information acted on, I would say. So it seems like awareness, touch itself, are partners for the practitioner. Would you agree? Yes. So to just kind of flip that, one of the first things when I'm teaching people about the use of touch in the context in which we're talking, that I'm teaching them to do is to separate their attention from their hand. Okay. So, and this also is about a cultural norm about touch. So we do this collusion in most contexts with touch, that there is a toucher and a touchy. Mm -hmm. And so the clinician, let's say you're a massage therapist, the massage therapist is touching the client, the massage therapist is active. What nobody talks about is that client is also touching the therapist. Yeah. Right. They're touching them with their arm, with their leg, with whatever is quote unquote being touched. So we have this one directional idea of touch that it goes one way and that we as the practitioner are not being touched because we're using our hand, that's the thing we use to touch and nothing else touches. And that's just not accurate. Whatever we are touching is touching us back and both of us are gathering information about the other. And that information we're pretending is primarily coming from the location of touch. That's a strong cultural construct around touch. The way we're talking about touch, we're using a North American, typically Northern European version of touch. And these are low touch cultures. So in an hour, it wouldn't be weird for an American to not touch another person while they're talking to them, particularly in a kind of normal social, it's not my beloved or something. In some cultures, the number of incidental types of touch are like 20 in that same hour. So in some cultures, the touch is basically just a reconfirmation of the relationship that's happening. And it would be strange to not touch a person as you're talking to them, as you're interacting with them, even when you're not in a close relationship with them, you're having a social interaction because mm -hmm. touch is the manifestation of the relationship. It doesn't make the relationship. It's not defined in the same way we do. So I just really feel like it's important to say we're talking about a certain social construct here that we in a way can make a separation between the touch and anything else, our awareness, the relationship, that touch. And that's why I encourage people, let's separate your hand from all the other stuff that you're doing that you're bundling in and saying it's touch. And this will be important for the next piece of the conversation in terms of online. The most critical part of touch is you and how you are embodying the meaning 
there's different kinds of touch. I can put my hand on and you will feel demand because I'm touching you with the rest of myself demanding something from you. My hand isn't doing anything different, but you will feel something. I can give touch that's reassuring and my hand will be somewhat different, but it'll be about something else that imbues the touch with that quality of, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. And that relieving, coming present and and comforting kind of touch. That's a part of the training for me is it's not our hand that's doing it. It's us that's doing it. The hand is the instrument. The hand is the instrument for the expression of the form of touch. Just like in psychotherapy, your words are part of the instrument of helpfulness and inquiry with the client. So you better learn how to use them, how to use your voice, how to use facial expressions that match or don't match. In terms of training for touch, that's equally important because people think their hand's just going to automatically do the thing it's supposed to do. And so that all of that stuff like awareness, placement of attention, intention, what are, we, what are we doing with our touch? And then understanding on the other side of it, that person's experience of touch might be very different than what we think it is. So even with the best of intention to bring caring touch, their experience is going to cause them to interpret it as demand or aggression or whatever. All of that is present the moment we touch. So it's a yes and kind of answer. Yes, there are these different layers, but those different layers are informing us about what we do with our hand. And I really encourage people to think about touch not being about the hand. Touch is what we are doing together. That client is touching us back. And we need to be paying attention to how their touch back tells us how we are being received in the relationship that our hand or whatever could be the back of the hand, it could be another form of touch. But some of my clients' hands are too like problematic. So maybe we just lay a back of an arm against a back of an arm. Hmm. It's sort of like, yeah, I just really hardly like touch at all because our culture says this is touched hands together, back of arms together isn't really touch. Hmm. And that's okay then because it's not that charged, overwhelming, the hand is doing the thing kind of touch. It's goes into that category, like almost incidental touch, and we can creep our way towards the other version of it. A long-winded response to something, but I really, I think it's important for us to recognize that touch is very culturally influenced. Our our meaning making about it, the way we're considering what is touch, how we're even naming it as touch. We have a culture that says a hand does the touching, and the hand is the instrument. And what I'm saying is the hand is the instrument of you and the relationship and supports that. So you better be clear as the practitioner, what are you doing with that touch? And that's your awareness. That's your intention. That's all of those things. And the hand should follow that. And that's the way I teach it. Your hand should always follow your attention. The hand doesn't come first and then you figure out what am I doing with it? You should be clear with your awareness, your intention, the relational structure that's in place, the level of trust. All of that needs to be clear before your hand gets anywhere near anybody. (laughs) So the good thing is attention can be in more than one place. So sometimes if the hand is one place, attention could be in another place that needs care and particularly a place that would be more problematic to touch. Either the person can't have touch there, or maybe it's harder to reach, or maybe both these places need to be attended to simultaneously. So it seems like there is a way for attention only to be the source of touch. Yes. And that lets you also break the the boundaries of the basic construct of touch. Because for example, I work with many clients who are touch phobic. It's never happened yet that I haven't been able to touch that person. Putting it in the context, they're coming to me because someone either referred them to me to do some repair around touch, or they themselves have a goal. With one of my clients, she said, I'd like to be able to take a hug from my grandchildren and not brace against it. I'm doing it, but I know they can feel that I'm bracing and they think it's them and it's not. It's about how problematic touch is for me. Well, one of the things we can do is what if you come to the, your skin from the inside as the client and invariably we can find some other layer of the body, some other way of putting attention 
because it's usually the skin that's the issue around touch, but we can just pretend it's not there. What if we just touch your bone? Oh, that's great. I like that. Great. For yeah. the moment, we'll just leave the skin out of the picture of touch. We're touching straight to the bone. Even if my hand's on, we know I'm actually touching the skin, but we're not putting our attention on the skin. So all the stuff the skin has to say about this is problematic and I don't like it and it's scary is gently set aside. And then we get to talk to the bone that says, actually, I kind of like this relationship thing and having someone show up with me. Or the client puts their attention from the inside. It's like, well, actually the underside of the skin is kind of nice. If I'm touching from here to the surface, it's in my control because of course skin is a boundary organ, it's a boundary structure. So it takes on all this huge metaphorical load of managing boundary. So if we come up from the inside to that boundary and meet it from the inside, I get to say where the edge is, that's okay by me. Now the skin is not so problematic. So if we learn to use our awareness and sometimes our awareness is in the same place as our hand, great. And sometimes our awareness and our attention is in a different place than our hand. And hopefully we are guiding the client. This is one of the jobs that goes with this version of touch. We are guiding the client in developing their skillful capacity for awareness. So they develop the same tool and they can join us or go somewhere different. And now we've got two of us working together to create this form of attention that lets us a precision form of attention that lets us do now a different kind of work than we otherwise could have done. So this is one of the things that I so appreciate about somatic touch that you've taught me as well as the SE touch that I've learned. It is not passive for the person who is receiving the care. And I find that it's a tremendous training tool for them so that if I don't include them, if I don't insist, it's really their job on the table or if I'm touching off the table or whatever we're doing, if I'm not insisting to them that most of the work and most of the result comes when they develop capacity for intimacy with attention, with their own bodily system. That to me is the jewel of this whole thing. Yeah. And even that structure is, I don't even think of it as them receiving care. I think of it as a joint project. So the way I structure it for myself is all I'm doing is setting the conditions that make it likely that the thing the client has the goal for is going to happen. I'm setting the conditions that are going to increase the probability that they will find their way to touch that feels workable for them. And then if they do that enough, it feels so workable that it stops being a problem. So we're always co-creating, and that's in the language that I use. It's in how I'm, I'm considering touch. I'm not touching the other person by myself. I'm inviting them to tune my contact with them so that it's always okay for them, or my hand comes off or my attention comes away. The mutuality has to be there. And of course, I'm working a lot with people with trauma and one of the wounds that people have is that mutuality wasn't there and boundaries were breached um, and people touched them either inappropriately or painfully or uh, yeah. those are the kind of folks who more specifically go to people who know how to use touch. Their early experiences have had negative experiences with touch and so they're seeking someone out that's going to help them find another positive framework. Those of us who use touch get to know pretty early how we have to maneuver with people where touch has been a problem. Because if they're interested in coming to a touch practitioner to heal that, just embedded in that is that touch has been a problem. So we, and that's the other piece going back to the beginning. I was so outraged at the lack of training for people because who's coming to a touch practitioner, but people who have negative experiences of touch. And we should therefore be having people who do touch who are even better trained in how to do it. So they've already examined the questions around the appropriateness of touch and how boundaries happen and how we get to mutuality and there's permission. And it does take a certain amount of skillfulness to work proficiently with people where it's a little bit like a minefield to get touch on board. It's always, I wanna say that it's not a successful touch session when we got to touch. 
it's a successful touch session when the person made a different relationship with touch, which might include setting a boundary and saying no to it. I am so happy when a client finally gets supported to say, you know what? I don't want you to touch me or anyone to touch me right now. Fabulous. That's what needed to happen is get a boundary in here, get somebody on the other side of the boundary that says, woohoo, I am so happy to have that clarity and I ain't coming anywhere near you till you say, yes, let's do it. That's a good repair for touch. So it's not like we need to have, you know, touch is the holy grail. We have to move towards it. But what we want is that the all aspects of the self can be included, including that aspect that hungers for a sense of contact. And when we can find ways to fulfill that, that's to me very satisfying. But those are the skills we need is to be able to navigate that as the practitioner. So I just want to reiterate something that I don't think is spoken very much in general, which aligns with what you were saying about uh, Northern European white view of what psychology and psychotherapy sees as the relationship between the clinician and the patient. Yes. And the mutuality is not there in expertise. So there's always, I'm the clinician, I have the expertise, I know what you need, and I'm going to give this to you. This is the prevalent attitude. What I'm hearing both of us point at now is there's nobody that knows the patient's body, mind, heart better than them. Mm -hmm. They're the expert in them. I may have some skills that can help them to either transform certain aspects of it or to know themselves in different ways, but ultimately they are the expert. They're always the expert in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hearing both of us say this kind of mutuality and intersubjectivity has to be on board in order to do this kind of somatic work with patients and to have it work. Otherwise, it's just more of what they've seen before. Oh, there's somebody here who's telling me to do something or to be something. Yes, I agree. And there's an even an additional element to that, which is that it does put a certain demand on us to address our own issues around our embodiment because then yeah. you can get not just about this sort of hierarchical, I know what to do and I'm gonna tell you how to do it, but you can meet another person who's feeling shame about what's happening. One of the really disappointing things that happened um, when I, we were writing Nurturing Resilience, we did our best to trace any popular press information back to original research. So we really wanted the bibliography to be a resource for people uh, to find information about all of these topics that were um, even vaguely related to developmental trauma. And I got curious, what is the information out there? Do we have any research about what happens on the part of the practitioner when they're working somatically? I found one research study that had been done in Ireland. Um, this is a few years ago now, so there might be more. It was done only with female clinicians, which befuddles me why they did it that way. And the really disappointing thing was the majority of the practitioners felt a sense of shame when they had any somatic response to what was happening with their clients. And so I was thinking, oh, so maybe it's like people who are feeling some sort of sexual response or something like that, that they've been taught, you know, we have to keep these boundaries professionally. So I looked more deeply into the research and that was like the minority of it. It was when they felt anything somatically. It was like, I'm not supposed to be feeling this. I'm having a response. My breath is changing. I feel something more in my own body when the client's feeling something. And people felt a sense of shame about noticing their client somatically. And I was sitting there thinking, I've spent my life teaching people how to do that. <laughs> it's like the most important skill is to be responsive somatically and be present to yourself and get clear about your own opinions about what you feel in response to a client and be open to that communication. And I think because we don't really effectively teach people 
these somatic skills, clinicians are left to kind of stumble upon them themselves. We don't put the same demand that we would. You had to do supervision. You know, anyone who gets a license has to start, you know, like deal with your issues. <laughs> They're mm. less likely to interfere in the therapeutic relationship. We don't put the demand on people to do their somatic work, to deal with their somatic issues. So they're not, I mean, of course, we can't be robots in that way. We're going to have responses, but at least know what's you versus what's your client, what's you responding to your client, what's your vocabulary. So when I feel this thing, it often means the client's feeling afraid. So this is informational for me. And I'm not going to then let myself be moved into my fear and then shut down what's happening with the client because I feel afraid. I can't tell you how many times I've done consultations with people who work with trauma and they'll say something like, and then the client got too activated. Right. And interpreted that to me, the client's too activated because I now feel afraid. And so then they're interfering with perhaps a really wonderful thing that was happening with the client because the clinician now has been picked up by what's going on and moved into their own activation state. It's like, that's the training we need to be doing. So we're understanding our own somatic signaling. So it's not only about the hierarchy, power, differential construct. It's that we've, at the majority culture level, we've done such a poor job of teaching people about their somatic self, so to speak. Again, not that it's separate, but to know themselves somatically, understand what does that sensation mean? What is happening here if I feel this thing when I'm sitting with the client? How does that client feeling that thing and expressing that thing influence me? And how can I be proficient to not let my own like personal preferences come in and diminish what I can do with a client. We don't put enough of that demand on uh, practitioners that are using somatic methods. Yes. When you're trained as a psychotherapist, ostensibly, you're trained to notice what is called countertransference, which would be what's coming up in me when the patient is having X, Y, Z, and making that determination, what's theirs, what's mine, and how do I want to work with that? But, but I could tell you, a, a lot of the advice is, well, notice it in the moment, but then put it away and then go do some supervision around what came up for you. What that does for me energetically with the person you're working with is if you notice it and then you put it away, you basically have exited the engagement. So for me, there's something about skillfully in the moment finding a way to discern what's mine what's theirs and then discern is there anything useful here so maybe i do have some feeling of fear coming up but i'm not going to assume that's about them i actually am gonna question it and then can i skillfully find a way to join with them and ask something about just share in a skillful way. Oh, wow, I'm noticing this. What are you noticing? And then what it does is it invites them back into that position of expert and lets them correct me. If something is going on in the intersubjective space, that's not about them. And I don't feel afraid to be transparent like that because I'm transparent energetically anyway to them in the intersubjective space. So why should I hide that transparency in the engagement relationally? I know this is tricky, what I'm suggesting. You have to really be trained quite a bit to do this, but it just seems honest. Adding on to that is the other thing that is sometimes happening is you're in now a pattern that has repeated for that person. So then all, the example I'll use is what's often referred to as traumatic transference and countertransference. And those of us in the physical care world are very likely to encounter this in particular ways. So what I have learned in myself is a particular, what I call a rising up. It's this thing that can happen with clients who are basically demanding that you help them while simultaneously putting every possible barrier in the way for you to do that thing. 
And what I have learned over time is when I feel this particular movement in myself somatically, it's like a rising up to, if I keep going with it, I'm going to bark at the client about this topic. And what I've learned is like, oh, this is the pattern thing that has probably induced in other practitioners that very response and say at a medical level, then that clinician, the physician, whoever is like, okay, then I'm going to order this test or I'm going to do this thing or call you a malinger or whatever. So the moment I feel that is like, oh, we're in that. And this is a client that has been subjected to those responses repeatedly. And that's getting elicited in me. And so then it's a, it, a version of what you're saying is instead of me doing that familiar thing, I can sit back and say, so, you know, that might, it's probably really frustrating that you so need help. And nobody's been able to find a way to help you. So let's sit here and back up. And it's my same kind of thing. It's my indicator to say, okay, let's back up and have a different category and conversation, acknowledge what's in the room. And it's, but it's happening more in that the trauma, their traumatic transfer, same basic dynamic. It's just arising out of the trauma. And it's exactly as you say, is getting skillful at working with it. So it stays in the room. Because I learned that is like, if I put this out of the room and just say, well, that's my business to work with later, the client got no benefit out of me figuring out a different response to have and to let it be present in the room to say, this is what happens with trauma. And I bet it's been true that you've had people kick you out of their practice. And, you know, some of the clients that I'd worked with had seen 50 or 100 different types of practitioners who refused to work with them that pattern arises, it gets completed. The client doesn't know a different way to do it, doesn't know how to move that conversation. If I can figure out how to do that with them, even though it might be messy and need repair and all of that, then we're getting somewhere. That's where I see that consultation and um, supervision helps because we're all going to get these things wrong, so to speak, and be messy with it. And then we can get consultation about how to do that better And these are the ways that we can, in fact, serve the client more is working with those things that are challenging for us. And this one of how you keep it in the room instead of having to move it aside is not an easy one. Uh, So it's not, we shouldn't put the pressure on ourselves to be able to do all of it well immediately, but it is something we can learn. I just, in one of the consultations I did recently, we had a conversation about a category of trauma that uh, is not one that is used as far as it's certainly not used in the somatic experiencing model um, and in some of the other models I'm familiar with. But when I went looking for the different categorization systems that are out there, one of the categories that was really relevant for me was the hearing of bad news. And for those of us in the physical care world, we very often have to deliver bad news Or like as a medical practitioner, you're giving someone the information about a terminal diagnosis or something like that. I'm often having to work with clients with the side effects of them hearing bad news. They're they're not going to recover from their brain injury in the way they thought they were. Um, They do have a terminal diagnosis or they have the diagnosis of a chronic disease that's going to be with them for their lifetime now. And this is, it's, it is another category of trauma. And I really felt like I just had to reinvent the wheel here. I didn't get any help for how to do this. And I was kind of surprised to hear that in the medical world, there isn't actually a lot of training for people. And there is a group of people that um, have been working on supporting each other for doing a better job because COVID has put an even bigger intense demand on that category of how it is that you bring bad news to people. And I think those are the kinds of places that reaching out to colleagues and going out to people in other professions that have had to figure this out ahead of you is really helpful. And for me, um, Judith Herman's book, Trauma and Recovery, I still don't know of any better description of traumatic transference and countertransference. That was the place for me where I felt like I started learning about it and how to navigate a bit better of what is elicited in me somatically in these somatic kind of conversations with clients where that countertransference will get triggered, it, particularly by this construct that it's our job to help somebody. And that goes back to what you were saying before is that you are giving in a way this sort of service to the, to the client in, uh, that you are doing the thing. That's the st- structure that we have 
in at various versions. And here we're talking about, it's my job to help the person somatically. And that sets us up for exactly these kind of dynamics. And so I think just finding ways to educate ourselves about what's going to be elicited in us somatically. And as you said, what's useful here, what's not information. One of the challenging things in learning to work, particularly with touch, is you'll feel a hundred thousand million things at any one moment. Are any of them important? Are any of them the things that you will use to figure out how to respond to the client? And so there is this learning the filtration process. Yeah, not relevant, interesting, but not helpful. What do you let go by in your awareness? And what do you learn to latch onto to say, that's the thing I'm going to follow. That's the thing I'm going to respond to. Here's some important information that tells me as the practitioner, what do I do from here? And that is learning. That is practice. It's not, you're not automatically going to know those things until you've had a chance to work with it. So one of the things that I could take a moment to do before we switch gears and go into how all of this has been playing out in the last year, I work a lot with physicians as patients. There is a distinction. I know there used to be this term compassion fatigue, but that actually is a completely inaccurate term. The actual term is empathic distress. Compassion and empathy are two completely separate brain networks the empathic brain network is tied into the insula, which is the part of the brain that processes pain, both physical as well as social and emotional. In order to have empathy, you have to have the ability to simulate the actual pain. If you stay in the empathic brain network and you stay with that pinging on the feeling of pain, when you, for instance, deliver bad news to a patient, you end up in empathic distress. However, compassion requires empathy first. You, you have to have that knowledge of what is the suffering. You have to know what the pain is, but very quickly, the clinician can learn to move away from the pain network and go right into how can I be of service? How can I help? What does the person actually need right now? And that switches the brain network into the prefrontal cortex, where we do moral reasoning, where we do executive function. And so there's no more pinging in the insula. There isn't the empathic distress response. So actually there's several trainings. The GRACE training is a training that's being offered to clinicians now. Cool. And I think you can add into that, and I would think it would make it even more potent, is moving into a broader somatic space. Yes. That for me is also how I'm doing it, is the, the same disturbance in a bigger space is less of a disturbance. And again, there's a sort of cultural differences of collectivistic cultures use the collective as a way to hold it. So then it's not a single person having to be in that channel is the collective is there to hold the grief and to hold the, the distress or the pain. So that movement out into a broader collective is another deepening of, I think, that skillfulness. And again, as you referred back to is the medical model that is the model that we're using primarily in North America. And again, the majority culture is an individualistic model. And so we give care on this individual basis, and we're not really encouraging the care providers to be a part of a bigger collective necessarily. I think it's been happening more. It's had to happen in COVID of people moving out into a broader sense of interconnection. It's a little bit too little too late, I think, for many people. But that's the other piece of the puzzle is that the possibility in working somatically is also to be connecting to the somatic collective, because I really think like on a different map to get specific about it, that our somatic systems and particularly the visceral systems are actually a part of the social engagement system. And I think it's one of the ways we find our collective. It makes sense to me from a survival perspective that we would be able to feel our group members, even when we can't see them, even in the dark, even when they're behind something else where we, ha we have to find them to know where we are in terms of securing our survival or securing food or whatever. It's just always made sense to me that we had this other way to communicate that wasn't based on being able to see people 
or hear them or talk to them. And that's how I see people working somatically. And that to me argues in favor of not being isolated somatically. And I, that does actually come back to the piece of the conversation in terms of working remotely is, of course, one of the things that's happened in the pandemic is people have been isolated. And I think that's been very, very challenging for a lot of people. Some people find it a relief, actually. They don't have to work so hard anymore. They can just be at home, which is really what they wanted to do all the way along. Um, but I do think there is this risk that it, it disconnects us from the somatic collective in ways that for some people are very harming. Banding together was our superpower out on the savanna. Our species would not have survived without this. This has been quite destabilizing in so many ways, not just for the people that we see as clients and patients, but also practitioners. Right. Maybe we could start to really talk about what this has been like over the last year and how being forced out of one's office and away from physical space, uh, how that has impacted the use of touch and somatic psychotherapy and somatic practice in general. Oh, that's its own topic, isn't it? Yeah. It's one of those things where there's some unexpected good things uh, unexpected to me anyway. I thought it was going to be only bad. We've seen the possibility of having access for people who didn't have access before. It was a strain to support the needed travel for even just bus fare for some people. If they're the one that has to go to receive care of some sort. So for some people, there's been increased access. I've certainly seen that in the teaching field. I'm assuming there's some version of that, depending on what happens in licensing and whatever. One of the things that's happened is people in cultures where a somatic approach is even less known than in our culture, they're now finding like-minded people. They're able to find colleagues that they can consult with. Um, they're by themselves in communities working to support their clients and patients, and they have no one to talk to about what they're noticing, what their challenges are. And now they're having access to a broader community. That's been fabulous. I assume that some clients are finding their way to practitioners that they otherwise would never have had the possibility of working with. And they can now find them for people who want to work somatically. Some cultures don't support it at all. It's just mm -hmm. not a part of the treatment culture in any form. So for clients that are desperate for having a somatic influence in the work, They've been freed up from their local region and freed up from the costs. And for some people who were having to travel and stay in places for extended periods to get help for their family, for example, they're not having to do that. So that's one benefit that I've seen. The other benefit is it puts pressure on practitioners to be more precise. One of the things that I've known from early on in teaching clinicians how to incorporate touch is for some people, it becomes the thing they do when they can't figure out what else to do. And so one of the things from wow. the very beginning that I've been saying to people is there's two big contraindications for touch that have nothing to do with the client. The first one is you're using it because you can't figure out what else to do. That's actually a reason not to use touch because you're just using it as like, oh, the client will feel good. I'll just do this little touch thing and they'll feel like I'm connecting with them or whatever the logic is that says, I'm completely lost and freaked out about what's happening with my client. So here, I'll just do some touch with them. <laughs> this is just the, the wrong time to use touch. So that's one big contraindication. And the other is when you don't feel comfortable doing it. And that goes back to what we were saying before. Is there something about the touch that is alarming for you? Yeah. Or you're not sure if you should be using it with what's happening with this client. This is a good time not to use it. So in the online format, those little crutches that people were using touch for are gone. You don't get to just use it because you're lost with the client. So that has put a demand on people for a level of precision in their assessment of the client that is not there when you're in person and you can kind of get away with being sloppy and use your little friendly tools that you've developed that skate over your lack of knowledge or, and touch is one of those places that I've seen people use to fill in the gaps 
or throw in a little somatic exercise because I, I'm lost and I don't know what else to do. It also has put a demand on precision in the skillfulness because if you are guiding the person, if you're guiding with touch, you can be kind of approximate and not really know what you're doing and you'll sort of get there. But if you're guiding someone in a guided imagery, you're inviting them to notice things within themselves. If you're working in an online format, you better know how to get there yourself because you will be using that resonant field across an electronic medium. It works, turns out. That's been one of the really surprising things for me is the electronic medium is kind of like the hand. It's the instrument and it's the instrument that uses the very thing, but you better have the thing. You better know how to be embodied and be present to your client because you're going to have to do it. You can't fake it in this format. And then your observation skills are going to have to be better tuned. You're going to have to translate what you're seeing into what you would feel. That's been something I've been having to do as I've been teaching. I haven't been seeing clients other than to do demos. I haven't been seeing clients online, but I've been teaching and I have been doing demo practices. And what I really have to rely on is my observational skills visually and in this sort of funny electronic modified medium of resonance to notice what's happening with the person. And I really noticed it recently. I was doing a demo. We had three people. So we had an observer who was going to step into the role of clinician because part of the exercise, which we've always done as an in-person exercise, that I am not recommending you do this with a client. It's educational for the practitioner only, but you turn your back to the client. It's to trigger a neuroceptive response. In person, I've always been able to feel what's happening with the client and know when I have to turn back around, I could not figure it out. I needed the other observer to come in to say, turn back around. I was mm. like, okay, so that's important to know. I've lost some way of reading people that I can get when I'm in person with them that doesn't translate into this online format. So do you think that that's a proprioceptive property you can't have unless the organism is actually in physical space with the object of perception through proprioception. Through some system. I don't know. It was, it's curious. It's recent that it happened. It's like, so this is new information for me about the things that don't work well in this format. And now I can say, this is one of the things that doesn't work well. I don't have the same access to the field three-dimensionally that I do in person. So I don't have my well-developed tactile system, my hands to get in there and give me more information if I'm not sure what I'm observing otherwise. So I don't have that. And I don't have that other resonance. And so I'm going to assume that it's also not there for the client. So we're yeah. losing something that I can't quite yet figure out because I can say the online work seems to be working really well. I'm hearing that from lots of practitioners that things are going well. Some people are saying some things are going better. I'm assuming because of the demand for the precision and also for some clients feel safer. They're at home. And the engagement because yeah. it's possible some of the clinicians who it's going better for, they are having to involve the patient more rather than thinking they're doing everything. But you know, it's interesting that you bring this up because I hadn't thought of this. There's a lot of people I work with who are extremely disembodied. And I mean, to the extreme, they have no body awareness whatsoever. And there's a lot of times when I'll spend time getting them to experience proprioception. Like we think we only see through our eyes, but my experience is all the cells in the body are like eyes and they can actually see and feel everything around them. So if the person's in training on the table and you turn your back to them, your back is still seeing them. So maybe that's why you can feel when it's time to turn around and we can't on Zoom. Well, I certainly couldn't. I would have thought I could. I actually, because so much else has translated it was really a surprise. And the person who was in the observer role who became the practitioner was saying, oh, I liked it. I could see so much more in her <laughs> neuroceptive response. It's like, yes, but I couldn't with my back to her. And so the things that I have heard consistently from people and what I've observed that don't go well, people who really need 
to feel you, to know where they are, are not being well served by this. People who really don't have reliable access to safety. They're being served in the sense that they can stay at home, but it's not necessarily building their capacity to build a greater safety system. And those who really are deeply disconnected from their somatic system, I don't think this is enough from what I'm seeing. This isn't enough to build the skillfulness. What I can see is for practitioners who already had some skills in working somatically and in touch are doing very well transferring over to this format. Those who have no experience are struggling a bit with it because they don't, oh, yeah. they don't already have the tool to use to adapt it for doing online. And the same can be true for the clients. For clients who are well underway, they've made this transition and uh, the people that I'm doing demos with are generally people in the training. Although I've done a few with, I specifically have chosen to work with people who don't have that background because I thought it's, it's important for people to see what it's like to work with someone who's not already a professional at this, so to speak. And still it adapted pretty well if people had already been doing a lot of somatic awareness for themselves. But just starting out, I think in-person work is really going to be critical. I'm actually hearing you kind of come up with a set of categories for which remote is not appropriate and categories for which remote actually is pretty good. Yes. And I've seen that, for example, my daughter-in-law is a therapist and she was working at a clinic that serves some of the most underserved members of the community for mental health. And what she said is they, they've actually all the way along with full masks and face shields and everything been continuing to see some of their clients. It's just not at all tenable to move them into this kind of format. First of all, they don't show up for their appointments. They, their lives are not organized enough to figure this kind of thing out. It almost reproduces that sense of the objectified person and the objectified therapist person relationship. It's frightening for them. And so she said they've just all the way along abiding by the government guidelines. They've just, it's been an essential uh, medical service to provide people who are in these categories of the most need. So certain people with particular types of mental health issues, I think absolutely they need to see someone in person. And people who are starting out at the, the, on their journey of healing and developing this, these somatic skills, I think you can still move them along. We're, we're stuck working um, online at this point in it. I'm not an advocate for doing nothing. I think whatever you can do in the online format is going to move the person along. But at a certain point, I think people will see if they go back to working in person, they'll see people jump forward in the skillfulness when they can be present to that resonance. I'm sitting across from the person, they're learning from you. How does this happen? This is how the digestion goes. This is what happens when we're feeling safe. Our guts burble along and our muscles do this thing. And that's not as feelable in this format. The, the other problematic person would be someone who is in an environment that doesn't feel safe to them. Yes. Or doesn't feel private. So in fact, so in the beginning of COVID, like a few months in, my physician patients, they did not want to see me over Zoom because they were on telehealth all day long. I've had people all the way through. They don't have privacy. They can't really speak without somebody hearing them. These are people who also need the safe environment where they could come and work with me. So of course I've been, you know, doing the protocol and everything, and you can't imagine what they have to be doing in their personal life to be able to come and see me. It, at this point, it's 50-50. I've got 50% of the people who are still doing remote work with me and 50% who are in the office with me. Well, and I think that may be the new normal for practitioners. I certainly know practitioners who have decided they're never going back to in-person. And those are usually for practical reasons that are about the practitioner, not about the clients. Um, it's expensive to have office rent and they've discovered without the burden of the office rent, they can see fewer clients and do better self-care for themselves. 
and it just works better for them to not be commuting. You know, those are the kind of choices people are making that are not about clients. Other people are not going back to in-person work for the reasons I referred to earlier. They're working now with clients that don't have access if they're doing it in person because they're living other places where they don't have access to this work and people have made the decision to serve a different population of clients that they can do in an online format. And then other people are having this kind of mix. They have some clients who are actually preferring the online work. It's easier for them. And then they have clients that the minute you can come back in person, I want to be seeing you. And, mm-hmm. um, and I certainly know a lot of the somatic practitioners I'm working with are just feeling like they're giving up too much in the work with the client by working online. And the moment they can go back to safely working in person, they're in there and they're going to be 100%. That's the work that they want to do. So I've seen variations on both. Um, I'm hearing that some clients have preferences and I'm hearing practitioners who have preferences. So I think it'll be an interesting transition as we can finally be working safely again and clients feel more comfortable coming in. How that sorting ends up happening, that we really feel like we are serving clients well for certain kinds of clients seeing them online. And that's not really much of an issue and they're making good progress and Ethically, it feels like we're doing as much good for them as we could otherwise. And then there are some clients that are not being served well by working in that way. And they really need to be seen in an in-person environment for many of the reasons that you said. Um, and for me also with the, the, the office that I used to have, I don't have a client office anymore. Mm-hmm. I was very attentive to all of the different structures in place for the client population that I worked with so that as they walked into that space, it was triggering in them the responses about safety. This is a place where I get to be who I am and there's someone welcoming of me. And there was something about the physicality of that that I think is important, that it induces a certain somatic state that is the state we want the person to spend time in It's a state they don't get to spend that much time in elsewhere in their life for lack of safety or and the in-person space can do that in a way that the online space can't. So are you shifting the way you're doing the somatic practice trainings to emphasize or incorporate some of these skills that people really need if they're going to see people remotely? Yes. And that was really, I had not planned to do that adaptation, do the, the touch programs in an online format. But I got so many requests from people who were basically saying, it's going to be a year still that I'm going to be working in this way and I'm making the best of it, but I need help in how to deepen some of the skills that are being demanded in this way. And as I moved more into teaching, I realized there's a lot of good stuff that you can do in this format if you're attending to some of the pieces of the puzzle. And I think uh, recently I read an article about Zoom fatigue and why they think some of it is is happening. And there was some really interesting information that made sense to me in terms of the gaze you're being looked at. So for some people, it's like performance anxiety all the time. For me, I'm like a dog going to the door when someone rings the bell. It's like, oh, it's people. I've been in isolation for so long. It's like, people are coming to visit. I'm so happy to Zoom. I'm not the slightest bit tired of it. But I know for people who are on all day in that professional context, it's just like, would you stop looking at me? How do you create that sense of connection and resonance that isn't dependent entirely on looking at somebody so the client can have a break? How do you take care of yourself? Those are important things when you're going to be working online. And the precision that we were talking about. Ironically, in this format, some of the knowledge of the anatomy can be helpful. I've not been one that has really felt like you have to know these details in order to do touch work well in this context, but actually it turns out it's helpful for people to have an image to use about where they're placing their attention. So even something like using 3D anatomy apps and that kind of thing is actually useful. They're relatively inexpensive. People can have access to them. So whatever tools people need to feel like they get the imagery so they have an idea of what they're aiming for themselves or how they're guiding their clients, those are the things that can be useful working in this format that are not so necessary when you're working in person. I just can put the 3D anatomy app up and you can rotate it under here. So if you put your attention under there, what is that like? So there's things like that that you can't easily do in person, although some people have an iPad. 
I, I, I drag the netter book out and have the picture. Me too. So we're kind of doing the same stuff we've been doing in the office or just finding a way to do it in an online format. Um, in some cases, it's just a little bit easier. Mm. Well, this is what we're figuring out is what works, what doesn't work, who does it work for, who does it not work for, including us as the practitioner. And then as we make these transitions, the transitions are going to be tricky. We know that. Um, I have colleagues in Australia. I've done a lot of watching what's happening in Australia that's done a really good job of managing yeah. the pandemic overall. Life is mostly back to normal. And mm -hmm. still they have outbreaks and need to pause and go back into lockdown in small regions or small ways, certain professions or what have you. So I think we're going to have a bumpy road with that for a while. Adaptation is the thing we're all going to have to be good at. Adaptation is what human beings are excellent at. That's right. The other thing that I know that's happening is just a level of fatigue from the intensity of support that many people who have been able to continue working online, which is not every kind of practitioner, needs from people for the assistance that has been provided have been so intense. I know many, many practitioners are just getting worn out and we're not done yet. It's not just self-care, but it's community care of how we connect with each other, how we attend to ourselves from the very beginning, the very first community uh, thing that I did with the SE community. What I was saying is we are seeing the beginning of a huge trauma wave now. And that was not quite a year ago and we're still in it. And so I think supporting our clients, supporting ourselves in whatever way we can, even if it's not the ideal structure is so important for all of us to come through on the other side with as little damage as possible. Because even after we're apparently immediately done with the pandemic itself, the aftermath is still going to be coming. So if that means just clearing your schedule for a bit to have a break, even when you have clients that seem still pretty desperate, otherwise we're not going to be able to provide care for people. And that goes back to the empathy fatigue. It's one of the things when I did my master's thesis, I interviewed uh, uh, practitioners and teachers. They were all educators that had a minimum of 30 years of experience. In this case, it was about teaching in relation to trauma. The majority of them had serious health issues. It was very sobering for me. I came away with it. It's like, that's going to be me if I'm not building into whatever I'm doing some way to recover myself and some way to work with what happens when you're holding the difficult things that happen to people. And so if people haven't already developed those methods for themselves, we absolutely need people to do that. My experience has been it's the most experienced clinicians that have been bearing the biggest burden of being helpful. Yeah. Before we come to a close for the physicians and therapists who are still doing anywhere from six to 15 Zoom sessions back to back to back all day long, is there any one simple thing you would recommend that they either do in between the sessions or they do during? to be a little more soft, a little more present, a little less strained? I would give two suggestions. Is the first is to recognize that the, the technology is not the thing you're doing. Really, it's the person opposite you that's the important thing. And whatever way you find that person is critical. And it's easy to get lost in the technology piece of it and have that be the interface rather than the person. And the second one is related to that, which is whenever you can untether yourself from your screen and invite your clients, your patients to do the same is we can look away, we can do the things we would do in person. The screen demands us looking in a way that we don't in person. And so if we find a way to not have the gaze and this sense of staring into the screen be the way that we know we're there, that's really helpful. Just come back to yourself, find yourself, untether yourself from the screen 
and keep in mind that that person is still there and invite your clients to recognize that you're still there, even when we're not looking apparently directly at each other. Wonderful. You're still offering trainings, which is great. Yes. It seems like you and Tony are still doing the emotions trainings as well. Well, and interestingly, we had that conversation because of course, Tony is another big touch advocate. We taught together for many, many years and we wanted to make the decision. Are we going to go back to offering them in person in part because the travel to and from Australia is a bit problematic. They've really closed their borders. And both of us really felt like the benefits of continuing to do the training in this online format far outweighed the negatives. And part of it is access to the global learning community. We've had people literally from all over the world have access to the trainings in a way that they otherwise would not have had. And that has really felt like another version of service to the broader learning community to support a more somatic approach and have people have access to it. So we're going to, who knows if we'll go back to in person, I assume so, because we like to visit with each other. Uh, But for now, we're keeping things online because it allows us to be clear it's happening. We don't have to wonder if things are going to cancel out if travel gets troublesome for some reason. We've been finding it really, really satisfying to be able to share these learning experiences in the online format. It's been embarrassingly good in the sense (laughs) I really thought we just had to do stuff in person for all this goodness to happen. And that's like, oh, I'm proven wrong here. Turns out you can get a lot of good stuff done in this format. Thank you for the electronic folks who invented all of this. What would we have done without it? (laughs) People can find your trainings at somaticpractice.net. Correct. Anything else you want people to know before we finish our conversation today? I think we pretty much covered the waterfront on this one. (laughs) Well, again, this has just been fabulous. I learned so much as always with you. Great to have these chats. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to today's show. To get in touch, please visit groundlessground.com. Let's dedicate our efforts to the healing of our planet and all its inhabitants. See you next time on the Groundless Ground.